Hello, this is Heidi Steffen with Titan TV. Welcome to our PSEP 103 question and answer webinar. So we're first gonna start off with Mike Schmidt. He is from Heartland Video Systems. He'll be able to talk about the hardware and answer any questions um, that you might have. Off to you, Mike, it's yours. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, so again, my name is Mike Schmidt. Uh, I worked for Heartland Video Systems for about 20 years, uh, installing over 200 ATSC1 encoding and piece of systems. Uh, the last two years, I've been spending a lot of time heading up our ATSC3 lab and I've been involved with nine ATSC3 market deployments so far. And I've done hundreds of hours of lab testing with our various manufacturers to help develop feature sets and fix bugs and test interoperability between manufacturers and so on and so forth. Um, for this webinar, I wanted to talk about both systems, but I wanted to break it up into ATSC1, PSIP and monitoring first, then go over a little bit of the ATSC3 uh, advantages and workflow, and then get into the signaling and monitoring of the ATSC3 systems. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my first slide, I'm gonna talk about Tribeni. It's been doing PSIP since the beginning of this. Uh, they have a guide builder for ATSC1 PSIP, and uh, it's able to access guide data from more than one EPG source. So that's important uh, for channel shares, which is kind of critical to the early days of ATSC3, because most people are combining on a transmitter in the market to do an ATSC3, and then the, the one person that gives up his transmitter for the three broadcast has to share his channels with all the other broadcasters so he stays up with his ATSC1 system. Uh, if there's a PBS involved, that's usually a ProTrack channel and that's important to uh, be able to get their guide data as well. Uh, alternatively, uh, Titan can host everything. It just depends on how the people in the market want to do it. They have the ability to reference different major channel numbers so that uh, in a channel share, everyone still shows up to the viewers exactly how they did before they moved uh, you know, to a different RF transmitter. So the viewers don't notice anything. And again, that, so that's a big deal. Um, they have the ability to feed multiple encoding and MUX systems, uh, which is important for redundancy. Uh, and for ATSC1, there's there's quite a bit of that. For ATSC3, not so much right now. Uh, they have a Linux OS backbone uh, on their server. So uh, in the early days, it used to be a Microsoft OS that was less stable, but that's helped uh, stability a lot. Uh, and they, they just in general have the best feature set uh, and they're able to adopt to new rules required by the FCC. Uh, they sit on all the boards. So they are a very good platform for taking care of dynamic PSIP for ATSC1. The, um, the minuses or the, the drawbacks would be that they're higher cost than most of the other solutions. And they use a server platform for, uh, you know, to house their software. And that's pretty common, but because it's a, a server, it needs to be replaced every five years or so. So there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, ongoing expense to, to keep in mind. Uh, they have a monitoring tool as well called StreamScope. And uh, this is a, a transport stream monitoring device. There are um, quite a few different ways that you can get a transport stream into it. Uh, it can be over IP or ASI. Uh, they have SMPTE 310 as well, but we don't see that too much anymore. RF and file based. Uh, and the ability to record transport streams. Uh, recording transport streams is always helpful because uh, you can send your local transport stream off to you know, a manufacturer or to uh, us at Heartland Video Systems. Uh, we could play it into our modulator and see it on a television, just like we were at your station. Uh, we could do the analysis on our stream scope or even uh, um, you know, send it off to manufacturers for support. So it's a, it's a nice tool to be able to do that recording. Uh, but the best feature is that they have uh, automatic table referencing where in the background, 
all these all the table data has to um, has to interact with uh, each other correctly otherwise it doesn't work uh, if you were to look at each set of table data as text uh, you'd have to know all the referencing in your head and you'd have to be able to remember it or write it down and compare it manually it's pretty tedious uh, it, it, they have a nice green tick box that does it all in the background and shows you graphically that everything is right or if it's not right you know it points out exactly what referencing is wrong uh, that makes it a pretty handy tool as well one of the drawbacks to that is that it's higher cost than most if we move on to the the other popular atsd1 pcip device that we use it's a a, a little bit different idea it's a nevion cp505 and this device is is usually lower cost than triveni there are some use cases where that doesn't hold true but uh, in general that that's a true statement uh, in addition to being a piece of inserter it has transport stream monitoring so it's able to look at the pids in your stream give you bandwidths uh, min and max continuity counts uh, all the etr uh, error priority one two and three errors uh, so it, it acts as a pretty good transport stream monitor. It does not record the transport stream, though, uh, like the Triveni did. Uh, it has built-in format conversion as well. You can bring in ASI, SMPTE 310, or IP, and you can output all three of those standards uh, at one time. It is hardware, not computer or server-driven, so it doesn't need to be replaced, and it is then inherently more reliable than, than a server. Uh, it can also reference multiple major channel numbers uh, for channel shares and it, uh, it is only able to go to one uh, guide data source though so uh, we use this primarily <clears throat> excuse me with titan tv there is uh, also a main and backup input switch that can be either licensed to do automatic two by one switching or it can manually be switched two by one through the web GUI. Uh, so that's good if you. This is the best. The biggest one is that the encoder signal or your on air signal has to go through this device. So it, it is. You know another device in the chain that could fail and take you off air uh, so when you're using it for a two by one redundancy switch you have to be aware that you know if somebody pulls the power on that that's not going to work very well uh, as a switch anymore uh, and the other thing is it has no atsc3 ability or any roadmap to do atsc3 this is strictly an atsc1 piece of device uh, it can do static piece of or dynamic it doesn't uh, it doesn't care so if we move on to ATSC3, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the signal flow and you know maybe what makes ATSC3 attractive or at least a, you know an attractive idea right now. So a couple of the big things about the standard is that it uses a high efficiency video codec or HEVC video. And to give you an idea of how good that is, you can run a 1080p football game at about 1.5 megabits and have, you know, marginal degradation, like uh, definitely in the viewable uh, realm. It's not going to be perfect, but uh, it's probably equivalent to MPEG-2 at about 15 megabits. So 1.5, that's pretty low. Uh, it also uses a standard called AC4 audio, which allows for 7.1 audio and lower bit rates. Uh, in audio, bit rate isn't that much of a concern, uh, but to give you an idea, it's, you know, a 5.1 signal would be about 384 kilobits uh, in ATSC1, and we could do the same thing in AC4 for uh, 96 kilobits. Um, there's also some ability in the AC4 audio standard to uh, substitute your only your dialogue channel for foreign language and still keep all your surround sound uh, intact, and uh, that makes for a you know a more efficient use of uh, maybe some multiple language broadcasts. 
ESG is still part of the standard, so we get all our guide data that we used to. Uh, there is a non-real-time, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a laser pointer here. So this was the ESG, but the non-real-time component uh, is just uh, data transmission. But there is a broadcast app idea that people are doing right now where you can get uh, you know interactivity on your television uh, where you can choose uh, essentially video on demand through these apps uh, they just look like an overlay over the top of your screen when you engage them and then you can pick a maybe a news clip or a sports clip or you know anything that's local to the station that they have the rights over they can make that accessible and you can see that no matter what channel you're on or you know, when you don't want to watch it, you just go back to the regular uh, programming. So we've, we've been testing that in our lab as well, it works fine. There's an EAS server here that does this thing called advanced emergency alerting. It doesn't take the place of the EAS crawl and audio that we all do these days, but it's more of an interactive, uh, layer for EAS where you could potentially uh, pull up radar maps uh, on your own. You know, if there was a storm coming, you could kind of zoom into your area uh, of the state or county that you were in so you could see exactly what was coming your way. Uh, special messaging could come up on there. Uh, so that's all done through the non-real-time data as well. And then there's an OTT or over-the-top arm of this where you can send your broadcast out to a CDN and transmit it out to uh, everyone in the viewing audience that can receive your RF signal. Uh, they will automatically have rights to receive your OTT broadcast. Uh, one of the big reasons for doing this is UHD. UHD takes up a lot of bandwidth and it isn't practical to send over the air, but uh, it can go out over the uh, broadband pipe and that is a potential for revenue. Uh, it's possible to, for instance, have an, uh, a UHD channel OTT that is encrypted and people would have to pay for it. So these are all ideas that haven't really been uh, done in practice because this is all pretty new, but it's things that people are testing in labs and, and trying to see if there's a business model for that. So that is the, that's the basic idea of the inputs. Uh, the, the rest of the, Signal flow is entirely different from what we're used to in ATSC-1. Uh, we do dash packaged uh, encoding services into a thing called a route server, and that converts the dash to a uh, dash route multicast. Uh, that in turn goes into a broadcast gateway, which turns that dash route multicast into an STLP, STLTP, excuse me, multicast, and that goes out to the exciters and you can have many different physical layer pipes or PLPs. You're not limited to the 8BSB 19.39 megabit pipe that we have in ATSC-1. Uh, you get to configure uh, them to be what you want and how many you want. So there's a lot of flexibility in this. So now we'll move on to looking at the signaling and ESG, which is pretty much like PSIP in ATSC-1. That's what it's called in three. Uh, so Triveni makes a Guide Builder XM. It's a virtualized uh, system. Uh, it goes on a server. It does uh, route and another thing called MMTP. That you can do route or MMTP. They're just two different standards. Almost everybody is doing route. Uh, MMTP I've not seen yet be used, uh, but they support both. Uh, Triveni also has a broadcast gateway, which is needed in ATSC3. And uh, it's important that right now, in the early days anyways, that we stick to the same manufacturer because they have to work together well. Um, so Triveni has both uh, the, the route server and the gateway, uh, so ease of integration is there. They have the ability to access guide data from more than one source and the ability to reference multiple major channel numbers and that's important for the channel shares because just like in the ATSC-1, uh, ATSC-3 will do the same thing in the beginning. One transmitter, everyone in the market is going to send their main HD to that one transmitter. 
and they're going to want their existing channel numbers to show up to their viewers. It has a full feature set. Uh, the GUI has many points of monitoring to help in troubleshooting that just come with it. Uh, and that's, again, important in ATSC3 because there's not a lot of test equipment available and it's all new. So the more you can see, uh, the better off you are. Over here, we see a, a picture of what it is. You get to see the thumbnails of the video, uh, the dash packaged video coming in. You get to see incoming audio and video bitrate and outgoing audio and video bitrate. So that tells you pretty much everything you need to know, uh, even without having a, an analyzer at hand. Uh, it is a Linux OS, and again, Treveni's on the boards, and they will adapt uh, to the new rules quite quickly. Uh, higher cost than most would be the one minus. Their StreamScope XM is, uh, again, a, their monitoring device, and it is the, the best one that I have seen. Uh, it does do route, uh, MMTP, and the STLTP uh, monitoring. It has an RF module, even for the higher order modulations like 256 QAM that are uh, allowable and used in ATSC3. Uh, you can record all the inputs, and it has the ability to play files for analysis, and you can record to capture the files. Um, it has an easy-to-use GUI interface that comes with their automatic table referencing that they did in ATSC1. So you can see here that you can drill down into all these boxes, but the signaling checklist is this checkbox here, the green check is the overriding everything is healthy. Uh, if that has a, a red X in it, then you drill down and you try to find out what part of the broadcast uh, isn't working right. Uh, you get a thumbnail representation of the video for every channel that you're broadcasting. You get a lot of graphs that show you bandwidths of all the different uh, components that you're putting out. So it's a very handy device. Again, uh, in the early days, uh, invaluable, uh, especially, um, you know, for somebody that's going up with five or six people in a market that are relying on them to make sure that their signal is broadcast. It's, a, it's kind of a big deal to make sure you know exactly what's going on. Uh, the minus, higher cost than most. Uh, other devices out there, but again, it does more than anything else. Uh, another company that we use that is strictly ATSC3, they have no ATSC1 offerings, uh, are Anensis, and uh, their pluses, are, in general, they're lower cost than Triveni, and they also do the route and MMTP that Triveni does. Uh, they have a broadcast gateway, uh, Again, it's critical. You need it for ATSC3, and you want it to be the same as your route server because they work together directly, and we don't want integration problems between different manufacturers at this point. And their route server and gateway have some ATSC3 monitoring built into their web GUI. Uh, you know, a few of the things that they, they don't do would be um, access, they're not able to access guide data from more than one source. In general, that's not going to be that critical because Titan TV can supply guide data from everyone in the market and then we can get everything from one source. Uh, their GUI, well, it has some monitoring ability, it doesn't have uh, as much as the Triveni. And uh, there, there are a few things that you don't have access to in the GUI that you might need to get uh, an ENSYS in via command line uh, to take a look at or to change or to help with troubleshooting. Um, and just in general, the, their ATSC3 monitoring, they do a good job in the RF, and they do some ATSC3 um, signaling monitoring. Uh, it's just that Triveni has a more full-featured set. And uh, before I finish, I wanted to, be, while we were working on the slide presentation, we, we got introduced to another company in the ATSC3 field. Their name is Digicap. And I've been working with them in the lab, and I, I just wanted to throw out their name as another uh, uh, company that is doing a good job. They have their equipment in uh, in five markets that Sinclair has done across the country already. Uh, they work with uh, they work with U.S. based encoding systems, and uh, they are the ones that were doing the app delivery for my testing, the broadcast app, where you can get the you know the skins to come up on the TV set and you can interact and, and play VOD video and 
uh, sea weather graphics and all that kind of stuff. It, it, the, the limitation is only in the programming. You know, if you if you have a visionary that can program in JSON, then those apps could be whatever you want them to be, and they're actually a pretty cool uh, tool. So uh, that company Digicat makes a Digicaster route and uh, broadcast gateway, just like uh, Trivenian and Ensys do. And uh, they're a Korean company. They also run their uh, Korean national broadcast there. That's been running since 2016 from the Olympics. So they also have some practical experience, which is really nice for me and my lab. That is everything that I have. Thank you. Great. Does anyone have any questions for Mike related to the hardware? Or Mike, what are some of the, the, the most asked questions that you get um, regarding hardware for PSEP or ESG? Well, right now it's um, it, in ATSC1, uh, everything's pretty much uh, known, so there aren't a whole lot of uh, there aren't a whole lot of questions. Uh, you know, it comes down to uh, the decision between Triveni and Amensis is, I mean, uh, and uh, Nevian is simply if you need to do more than one transport stream, uh, you have to buy one Nevian unit per transport stream, whereas the Triveni ha uh, can actually supply a stream to, uh, for multiple transport streams. And that's when the Nevian gets more expensive than the Triveni. So it's it's really just a matter of identifying exactly what everyone's trying to do to be able to work out the best price solution. Um, and in ATSC1, it's to me, it's exactly that. It's just the they're both good products. It's, it's whatever one comes in less expensive is probably the one that you should go with. ATSC3 is a little more difficult because nobody really knows what they want quite yet. Um, so there aren't a whole lot of questions other than, can you give me something that'll work? The thing that I would say is that because right now it's really just putting up linear uh, live video services, right? that you put SDI in with embedded audio and you want to see that as a HEVC stream on a television. But ATS3 is a lot more than that. There's a lot more that you can do with it. But right now, all anyone wants to do is put their video and their audio from their main channel on. So you could, you have to look forward a little bit if it's even possible right now and try to figure out, you know, where you want to position yourself maybe in two or three years. And if you, maybe if you make the, you know, the wrong choice to start with, you may have to spend some more money later. So that that's where we try to help people out, try to decide where they want to go and maybe give them some advice as to, uh, you know, what they could be thinking about beyond just the video audio services. Great. And if someone had additional questions, um, our our website, uh, www.hbs-inc.com, uh, would be a good place to start if you don't already have any contact with our, our sales teams. Uh, we've got salespeople in every area of the country. Uh, and uh, I can send out my contact information to the group if I can get that data. Uh, and that way, anyone with questions uh, following this can always send me an email and I'll respond to it. and. If right. it turns into a sales thing, we can always get them in touch with this appropriate salesperson. Awesome. I think that's all the questions we have so far. Thanks again, Mike, for that presentation and answering a lot of the questions related to hardware for PSEP and ESG. Now we're going to hand the reins over to Marge Johnson um, from Titan TV. I will have her introduce herself. Again, if you have questions um, about the PSEP data, ESG data, please ask them throughout and we'll try to answer them throughout it and then also open it up at the end for additional questions. Marge. Thank you, Heidi. I'm pleased to be with you this afternoon. Um, many of you may know me. My name is Marge Johnson. I have been with Titan TV about uh, 12 and a half years now. And uh, I've worked with PSIP um, at least 11 of those years. So uh, I'm very familiar with it and will be happy to answer any questions you may have. 
And by the way, um, I would just say you were listening to one of the best speakers in Mike talk about hardware. The man knows piece of hardware. <laughs> so I'm sure you you enjoyed that and, and can have him answer any questions for you. Um, today, I titled this PSIP 103 because um, we've talked about PSIP with uh, NAB several times through the years. And so now we want to talk about a different aspect if you're a low power station or in transferring to the next gen 3.0. To just give you a little basic bit about this, uh, let's just start with what is PSIP? Well, PSIP stands for Program and System Information Protocol. It comes from the ATSC A65 standard, the Advanced Television System Committee standards. It was created to send metadata about every channel in a broadcast transport stream from a TV station. And it's provided so viewers can select programs by title and descriptions. And you probably can relate to this in the fact that you press guide on your remote or menu on your remote and you wanna know what's on next or later on. When we think about what data we have to put into a piece of data file to transmit for you. Just think about any schedule you might be looking at, you know, any movie we have, any newscast or sportscast, even if it's, a, you know, jewelry TV or something like that. There are bits of data about audio and video and other data re related to all of those things, all of those programs. In addition to the data tables that have to go with every PSIP file, the program map table and the electronic program guide. So that is sent through the transport stream and ultimately ends up at the ATSC receiver that receives that transport stream so it displays on your TV. And in the lower right of the of this slide, I just put in a picture of what a guide might look like. Maybe not the one that you see, but it's it's a sample of a guide. Where his where uh, PSEP came from? Well, back in 2004, the FCC issued its first rule regarding the accuracy of PSEP data. Now they set no consequences for non-compliance, and that first rule went into effect in 2005. In December of 2007, when they were be beginning to really work towards that uh, digital television conversion, they required that the event information table be populated and updated with additional information when it became available. So think about suddenly uh, tomorrow we have to have a, a breaking news program, or even this afternoon there has to be a breaking program. How do we get that into the system? In 2007, the change set consequences for not transmitting an accurate piece set for over the air. Um, some fines were levied at $3,000 per violation for not using PSIP because some stations simply were not using it. And there were stations that's documented that were actually paying tens of thousands of dollars in fines for not using PSIP. So we come to a stage right now that if you are a low power station, a class A station, or a translator, you must move to digital by July 13th of 2021. So basically one year from now. Um, if you think about, um, oh, I'm sorry. If, if it is a fact that low power stations are not required to carry PSIP at this time, 
We did find that out. We confirmed that with the FCC. It took lots of tries uh, between Heidi and myself and several emails, but we did find out it has not been required at this time. However, two points to think about. The TV receivers in the marketplace will not scan stations that do not have at least a static PSIP. And then we know by experience that viewers want to know exactly what the program descriptions are, not just a listing of the Andy Griffith Show or Jewelry TV. Otherwise, the emails or phone calls start saying, well, which Andy Griffith Show or what are they selling on the Jewelry TV at 9 o'clock this morning? People get very specific about this now. So the PSIP files, especially going forward and into the ATSC NextGen 3.0 systems, are going to be PMCP PSIP files. This is Programming Metadata Communications Protocol. PMCP was designed to per permit broadcasters, professional equipment manufacturers, and program service providers to interconnect and transfer data among systems um, and eventually into the piece of generator so you don't have to re-enter information, you know, five or six times. This will work with traffic systems, program management, listing services, automation, and MPEG encoders. PMCP files are all XML-based, and this comes from the ATSC A76B standard. And as a side note, Titan TV co-chaired the committee that developed the ATSC PMCP standard that many systems use now. Do we have any questions so far? Not on the data. We did have a question come up of hardware, but I'll wait till you get done with the data and then we'll ask that one. Okay. Okay. Very good. So uh, what I'm going to do now is simply kind of walk us down through an actual PMCP uh, file, through an XML file. The first thing that appears in a PMCP file in XML format, uh, whether you see it or not, some uh, systems show this header and some do not. So you may not see it on, on your system. But the very first thing that has to be listed is uh, where this data is coming from. So you'll notice on this header, it says the destination of this file that is going to be presented is it's going to a P, P sub generator. It's originating from MediaStar, which is a Titan TV product. The origin type, we are a listing service, and then here is our uh, PSIP provider ID number. There is an ID number assigned to anyone who's providing data. And here is the date and time that this particular file was created on July 11th, 2020 at 1036 and 25 seconds in the morning. Now there's a little bit about that timing that says to me, this was created at 5.36 and 25 seconds in the morning. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The next thing that appears starts to actually talk about the channel that it's referring to right now. So this is channel 7.1, and then it has a short name. A short name is a station's call letters and channel designation. It's seven characters, no dashes, no spaces, nothing. Seven characters. In this case, I will tell you it's KWWL DT1. And then it's showing the TSID, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. The language of KWWL is in English. And this, uh, the description is going to be written in English as well. The next thing that comes up says we have an action of add. So I'm going to talk about putting, here's the program coming to us. The duration is one hour and zero minutes. 
And here's the start time again, 0711 at um, 0000. So that's midnight. Absolutely all start times in PSIP files are in universal time coordinate, UTC. Some people refer to it as Greenwich Mean Time. Some people refer to it as Zulu, but they are all written in UTC. You'll also notice that again, it talks about the channel number and the TSID. So when we're talking about universal time coordinate, if we want to figure out what that is, in the United States, we need to subtract the number of hours we live west of UTC. And UTC, a, a really simple thing that, that uh, a lot of people refer to is, is universal time coordinate is in London. It's not actually, you know, it's, it's, there's a line on a map coordinating it. But uh, that's an easy way to think about it, is in London. So how many hours west of that line are we? And another aspect that comes into it is the fact that it changes with daylight savings time. And then we have Hawaii, Arizona, and Puerto Rico that do not use daylight savings time. So on the East Coast, if this program were to air, in normal time we would use, uh, we would subtract five hours. Under daylight savings time right now, we would subtract four hours. Now KWWL is in the Midwest, so we need to use central time. And normally we would use minus six. But in this case right now in July, we are in daylight savings time. So if we subtract five from that 10 o'clock I showed you on a previous screen with um, when the file was configured, that says that this file was configured at 1036 in the morning. No, I, yeah, I'm sorry, 536 in the morning, which is very typical. Our piece of files are, are done at least by six o'clock in the morning. And by the way, if you ever need to use for reference, if you want to show it to anyone else and, and want to teach anyone about uh, deciding the proper time in UTC time, this exact slide is copied to our website at titantvinc.com. And you can look at that at any time if you want to think about what time something's going to be in Mountain or Pacific time. Any questions about that or have you ever run into that issue? No questions, but I know we get that question quite a bit when um, talking to engineers about PSUP and trying to understand the date and time that's in the PSUP file versus what is actually the time that it's airing in real time. Yeah, we sure do. And um, uh, sometimes, uh, depending if it's just around the date of the time change, uh, station engineers will call and think that the file isn't accurate, that it's off by an hour. And so we, you know, I look up the file and then I, you know, look at the dates or think about the dates and say, well, you know what, hey, on Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, it changed. So now we're only going to subtract four instead of, you know, and, um, you know, make sure that they agree that, okay, everything is okay. Okay, continuing on then with this information, we were, we kept seeing this TSID file number. And what is TSID and do you really need it or can I just fill in a number? Can I make it up? Well, quite honestly, you cannot make it up. But per the FCC, we must include PSIP within uh, a PSIP file and that is a transport stream identifier that the FCC assigns to transmitters of a station. If you are a low power station or a class A station who has never applied for a TSID number, it's really a simple process to obtain that. All you have to do is email mohan.simon at fcc.gov. Please include your call sign and your facility ID number. And Mr. Simon is a very, very efficient man. And we have 
had stations request a TSID number in the morning because we couldn't process a file until they had one. And they have received that TSID number in the afternoon and we produce files right away for them. If you've already been assigned a TSID number, that number will appear on any of your authorizations. So that would, at that point going forward, that would be on any files that you have or any documentation you have on file. Again, it's assigned to the transmitter at the station. And so even if you have a new transmitter built, or if you change, especially when we're doing channel sharing now, or going into the 3.0, um, you would need a new transmitter number or a new uh, transport stream identifier for a new transmitter. Because once it's assigned, it stays with that transmitter until it's decommissioned. The TSID numbers within the United States are anywhere from one to four characters. Uh, in the last month, I've seen some brand new ones that are now five characters. But there is a station in Alaska that only carries uh, one character and it is uh, number seven. Canadian TSIDs are typically five characters. I have not seen them go into six at this time. Okay, continuing down through what we discuss or what we present in the PSIP files, the next thing after all that preliminary information talks about, um, again, the duration of this program that I brought up, it's going to go on for two hours. And again, this one is going to start at um, one o'clock, so we need to subtract our five hours from that. And thinking about that in the original one I showed you, when we subtract five hours from midnight or five hours from this, you know, we're talking about programs that were last night. The first few files or first few programs within a piece of file are often or most of the time from last night. So this particular one would have been at uh, eight o'clock last night. And we come down again, here's our channel number, TSID, uh, the start time. It's going to be produced in English and our program title is Dateline NBC. Oops, sorry. And uh, the description is comes to us from uh, the network or from a syndicator. And in this case, the station wants it presented in English. That can be, you know, if you were a Telemundo station, as an example, everything would be in Spanish. Uh, we also have several that are in French. The next thing that is shown is the TV parental ratings. And this one happens to be TV PG and for the entire audience. Now, otherwise it might include things like it has violence, or a strong language, things like that. But this one is just for the entire audience. The next thing that is ever presented is about the audio. Now in this case, the audio, the first audio is going through in English. The second one, secondary audio is in Spanish. And that can be, these can be configured by the program or the whole uh, channel. The next thing that we we show is uh, the captioning information. This shows it's 708 captioning, and the language is going to be English. Now you can have multiple languages in captioning, and some of you might be familiar with when we used the 608 captioning that was on line 21, if I remember right. Um, we won't see that probably going forward, but um, it would be presented just one line above that 608 if it was still being used. And I just want to show, yes, 
We did have a question coming. This is back related to the TSID um, slide that you did. The question is, do you need a different TSID number for each transmitter or each transport stream? For instance, does a TV station need a different TSID for a translator? Um, if it's actually being transmitted from that um, transmitter, um, I just saw a transmitter the other day that was going to be uh, relaying, you know, a, a, a channel from its parent station, but now it was also going to add on, I think it was like MeTV. So you would probably be, need a new one for that. Does that answer the question? Yep, we have another question that came in. It says, if a change in audio format such as two channel versus 5.1 is made, does Titan TV have to get involved to make a change in the piece of info or does that come in from the encoder and just can combine um, with the Titan TV piece of info? Um, usually we set the audio, it can come in from the data provider. Uh, we can set it within that media star and put it into the system. I'm trying to see if there's any, I think that's it for now. Okay. Thank you. This particular slide, I just wanted to show you kind of some of this information all together. It's just an informative type of thing. Um, piece of files, if, if you can imagine that you have two or three or four channels, however many people have now, when you have a PMCP file and it's written in this XML data file, it's just one line of code after the next. And so this one is talking about here again is the ratings up here and here's the audio. And then it talks about the captioning. After captioning, then you would, if you were actually looking at this code, you, we would see here it, it's showing that it's the end of the show data. And now we're going to start a new PSIP event. And you'll notice on this line, here's it says it's adding, and now this is where it's at starting the next program in the stream. And some uh, someone was looking over my shoulder one day as I was searching for data for a question that a, a station engineer had, Be, uh, and they said, that is so long. And, you know, I just do lots of searches to find whatever they're concerned about. Um, the thing is, if you even pictured a roll of paper towels, and so you have four or five channels, and this thing just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling until you search. And uh, uh, that's just how it continues. And then if you also have uh, multiple uh, channels or stations within one piece of file, then, you know, I kind of start out looking for that TSID number. Okay, who are we talking about here? And then go from there. So these files get very, very long. Now you on the other side, you don't really have to see them. They download very quickly, but I just wanted you to see what it looks like to me when I'm working with this. So in the configuration of the PSIP files, PSIP files are proprietary formats for the hardware, like Mike was talking about before. Each PSIP generator or MUX by the brand, whether it's Trevini uh, or anyone else, uh, has their own preferred configuration. Now, since our company has been doing this for so long, we have lots of configurations on hand. It's not an issue. But if you chose to buy something that we didn't have the exact configuration for, it still works. We would simply ask you to have that company send us their configuration, a copy of their configuration, how they want it to be presented. We would have tests run internally to make sure everything was proper before it ever went into production. But these are all 
different, just like in another way to look at it, just like engines are different between cars, whether it's a Ford or a Chevy or a Cadillac, engines are different. Okay. The format of piece of generators and muxes are often different. Not all of them, but some of them are very much different. And at this time, if you if you wonder why we talk about PSIP files so much, right now, um, Titan TV produces over 900 files uh, every day. And that encompasses all, uh, it's like 3,950 or something like that channels that we, we make sure have data, correct data, all of this, and uh, send it out all the time. I know some piece of generators, I don't know if the new ones, newer ones today, some piece of generators that I have seen uh, have the ability to have you enter information at the hardware level. And Mike could speak to this, I'm sure. Um, my thought has always been, if you can have someone download files into it that you really don't have to touch it, because Mike or someone would have configured that machine to go out and download a new file at 6.15 every single morning. And then maybe a couple more times during the day just to be sure everything's the same. Or you get to choose from a monitor, hey, I wanna, I wanna see a brand new piece of file and it downloads it there. Then you, you can go off and do other things and you don't have to be concerned about getting everything typed in there correctly. That's just a side note. It Can I is, help you with any other questions? Well, it is three o'clock, so I oh, wanted to okay. um, see if anyone else had one, any other questions. We did have one come in from Mike that I'll throw out here quick. Um, yeah. Let me give, uh, the question is, do you, do you see a better product interoperability coming in the next two to five years as the ATS-3 gains traction? Yeah. I I definitely do. Over the last two years, things have really progressed a lot, and I'm optimistic. You know, as this thing starts to grow, everyone will be forced to, you know, to work better together. It, it's early days right now, though, and people are are trying to be early adopters. And the last thing that I want as an engineer is to have to try to get between two manufacturers to figure out, you know, if there was an issue, how to resolve it. It just seems like your best bet is the safe bet right now. And that's why I, I just mentioned it. it's a good idea to work, uh, you know, within the same manufacturer for the different pieces of equipment in the chain. Great. Um, let's see, do we have any other questions? Here we go. How does ATSC 1.0 PMCP information move from system to system? I don't know if Mike wants to answer that. Oh, when I said it could go to an MPEG encoder and, and so forth? That's just, the, how does an ATSC 1.0 PMCP information move from system to system? So for, from a hardware perspective, um, the each piece of hardware, whoever it is, the, they, they go out to the Titan FTP site, they're just programmed to do that. So um, that, would, that would be how it would go from system to system. You would just have to program in the FTP link uh, if you got a different piece of hardware and it would download the same PMCP data. Um, I'm not sure I understand 100% uh, the you know what what the question was really about, but that that from a hardware perspective is my best answer. Marge, do you want to add anything else to that? Well, I would just add um, you know Heidi how we are in discussions with some of the traffic systems that are out there to just simply pass this data and maybe add a little bit more to it. So 
traffic systems that a lot of us know about right now are still entering their own data. Um, and so if we can come to an agreement or, you know, as we run tests back and forth, that they could download it to into the PSIP generator and then also into their traffic system. And then that would just be, again, kind maybe a configuration from Mike's, from the hardware vendor, you know, to say, okay, here's how you get it from uh, point A to point B. Great. Uh, another question we have is, will recording this webinar be available to share with others? Yes, it will be. What we'll do is we'll send an email to all the attendees with a copy of the link to this webinar. Uh, we have another one from Marge that says, I'm new to PSAP. How far into weeks is programming to be recorded? One week, two weeks? So how much data, how far out is data in PSAP? When you choose to uh, have a PSAP file created, you can choose between three, anything between three days and 14 days. Those are the current standards. And I think this one is for Mike. It says, can the guide builder software be deployed on AWS cloud providers? Yes, it could be. And uh, uh, Trevini has a specific option for, for that, for a central CAD system. So that's uh, doable today. Great. Let's wait just a little bit more to see if we have any other questions come in. Again, I want to thank both Marge Johnson from Titan TV and Mike Schmidt from Heartland Video Systems for being our panelists today on Piece Up 103, giving you all the answers and from your questions that you have both on the hardware and the data part. As we explained before, we will be sending out an email after this, um, either later this week or first thing next week with a recording of this that you can then share with others. Um, thank you again for everyone for their time today. We appreciate listening to you. If you have additional questions, Marge has included information there. We'll also make sure we include Mike's information and Marge's information in the email that we send out. Have a great day. Thank you, everybody.